uh, and you can see it here. And perhaps uh, if you can see the cover, the reason I show it to you is not just so that you can all dash out and buy it, but uh, the two pops on the front by Greg Pace. Uh, and then on the back, there's a freeze of pots uh, from different places and times. And the reason for that uh, and, the, and the problems we had about creating the cover for the book really does sum up an awful lot about problems with the history of ceramic. Uh, in the prologue of the book, I kind of outline the fact that um, it's been decades and decades since uh, a single author had attempted to tell the, the story of Western ceramic, that is to say, Europe, North America, and its diaspora. And perhaps the reason for that was that art history as a discipline had sort of bypassed the history of ceramic or ceramic as a separate thing in itself. That ceramic had kind of become for academics and different uh, kinds of scholar, a kind of part of the story in something else. You know, there's a ceramic which relates to anthropology. There's a ceramic that relates to archeology. span uh, Ceramic comes up in all kinds of ways in disciplines. It's always been a little piece of the history of art, but usually, it's featured in the history of art when a famous painter or sculptor has worked with ceramic. So in some ways we might argue that despite the fact that there are probably thousands of books and if you go behind the scenes uh, into the library at the VNA, into the National Art Library, there's an enormous ocean of books, but the vast majority of them tend to be about marks. They tend to be about uh, uh, taxonomy of, of stacking up ceramic and trying to identify ceramic. But very, very few historians have actually tried to iron down what ceramic is and what it's been. And it seems to me as someone who's taught over the years in art schools and curated ceramic, that one of the major problems is this, uh, as it were, this, this lack of historiography, that the science of history had not been applied to ceramic. So I decided I would have a go at trying to do that. And uh, it took an awful long time. And I realize now I was gassing on to students probably for the last 15 years about what a history of ceramic might look like. And finally, I decided to stop messing about and I, I wrote what is a, quite a hefty book. And uh, uh, you saw the front cover and the, and the back freeze. And I thought what I would do tonight is to take you through some of the ideas in the book. And I thought also, given that it's Cornwall, you know, one of the great meccas, you know, one of the great regions of modern ceramic. Like if we took that region out of uh, the 20th century, what would happen to modern ceramic? Well, in my view, it would largely disappear uh, if we think of the kind of, uh, of what uh, uh, has been achieved by the potters of that region. And uh, I know some of you, uh, you're, uh, there are many potters listening tonight. So uh, for me, it's like talking to, you know, the Mecca, uh, one of the great centers of, of what ceramic has been in the last 200 years. So I decided to show you some pots that relate uh, to the region as well, as well as telling a broader story. Um, if you looked at the front cover, there are two pots by the great Canadian uh, Potter Greg Pace. And if you look behind me here, there they are. And the reason I selected these two particular pots, if you look at them, is that Greg Pace is particularly famous. He's principally a thrower uh, uh, and he turns pots as well. But he developed this approach whereby, as you can see between the two pots, there is a figure. And so he, his art is an art of uh, the spaces between. And uh, he, he told, actually very recently, uh, described to me about how it really came from Italian Renaissance Maiellica drug jars, which are curved inwards. The reason for that was so that when you stack them tight, you could get your fingers around and take it off the shelf. And he, had, he saw that when he was a young student and developed this extraordinary way of working. The reason I put it on the front cover is that, and the book is called Ceramic, Art and Civilization. Uh, I tend to use the word ceramic in the singular and not the plural. And it, it says why for quite complicated reasons in the book. So I won't go on about that. But I thought time had come to redefine art again. 
and also to relate ceramic to civilization. And perhaps while doing that, offer an idea of civilization at this time and what it might become. And I put forward the idea through the book that of all the arts, ceramic has been interlaced with the rise of world civilization, but absolutely civilization in the West and related uh, regions over thousands of years. I decided really, there's a big preamble about the world's oldest pots and so forth. In actual fact, we think the oldest shards now are uh, Jomon pottery, uh, the peoples who lived in what is now Japan, and we've got back to about 31,000 BC. So the uh, fired pots get back to the age of the great cave paintings, for example. They go right back to the dawn of what we have from early civilization. Uh, but really the story uh, kicks off and kicks in around about 8,000 BC. I have a preamble about much of that material because I, I really do feel that age and uh, endurance and the fact that pottery does not deteriorate at all quickly. In fact, of all the materials, as you well know, it deteriorates perhaps the slowest. The history of ceramic and the past of ceramic, it seems to me, is constantly hanging around every pot that gets made uh, and is an ambience in that. So uh, I have that preamble, but really I go from the ancient Greek uh, ceramic industry through to uh, the contemporary world. And I try to define what I think the range of ceramic is in my view. And then I uh, try and describe uh, what it's been and how it's been understood uh, through those ages. So that's what it's about. Uh, the book and uh, I'm sure that many of you will take issues with some of the things which are said but my real aim as a historian was to try and provoke uh, what I would call the history industry. Uh, at the end of the day we have to embrace the fact history is an enormous industry in the UK far bigger than the crafts far bigger than the arts it's an enormous industry that mediates much of what goes on in the world that huge industry has not really dealt well with ceramic in my view. So it's a book which is hopefully for a general readership, but hopefully a book which will provoke uh, a bigger literature going forward. And hopefully uh, it's a book which uh, practitioners uh, will find useful and helpful in their, in their own work. I have to say, I've spent much of my life with potters. I trained as a painter, and, uh, but got a job early on in my career at Cardiff uh, in what was a golden age of ceramic in the beautiful art school there. And Cardiff is still quite a powerful place for ceramic, I would say. Uh, and I fell in love with ceramic at that stage. And ever since have, uh, have continued on. I learned one wonderful lesson, which I'll never forget, is that most potters can cook. Most potters can cook. Uh, most fine artists can't cook. So when you get invited around to a potter's house, always go. You're going to be fed. Uh, fine artist, you could come away with salmonella poisoning. And I speak with great affection with my artist friends, but that's something I observe. Now, uh, this Trombloy pot by uh, Greg Place, the great Canadian, is on the front cover. But on the back cover of the book, um, I put a range of pots and I have most of them here behind me. Uh, and what we were, I was trying to convey was to choose a pots from that uh, were to do with different issues through the history of ceramics. So I, it's a little summing up of the history of ceramic in a, in a little freeze of pots. And one of the uh, big ideas of the book, uh, it seemed to me, is that when you look down on the history of ceramic, uh, if you could look down at it as a, as a giant landscape, the last two and a half thousand years, you realize that there are key moments in which enormous forces transform the practice on a national and international basis. That in actual fact, ceramic uh, in some ways is a steady progression, but in other ways, it's a, a tradition that got radically transformed by a relatively small number of what I call transformers. And I identify four, I think, first of all, uh, uh, the classical age, principally the Greeks and Romans, uh, transformed what ceramic had been around them and established a way of seeing ceramic and thinking about ceramic, which set an agenda which literally endured for, 
the next one and a half millennia. And I see that as the first transformer. And if we uh, look around, um, I have rather a nice uh, ancient Greek pot here, which hopefully you can see. This is a little wine cup uh, that was dug up in the Acropolis and you can see it without a shine. And in actual fact, as you can see, it has an owl on it. So this little cup uh, is highly symbolic and at the time would have been um, uh, a, a relatively cheap uh, drinking mug that could be, would have been widely used. What you're really looking at here uh, is the equivalent of a modern sports mug or a, a mug with a pop star on it or a mug with uh, your favorite football team or your favorite politician. Uh, because the owl represents Pallas Athene. She's a symbol for Athens. And these, these were made in the thousands, especially when there was a games, a Pan-Athenic games. So everybody would be sitting cheering for Athens, uh, drinking out of one of these. And we know that uh, many, many Greeks were buried with their mug, uh, much in the way that I would imagine Arsenal fans and Chelsea fans and Norwich City fans, where I, where I am at this minute, might well be buried with their team's mug uh, to show where they were. So this gorgeous feather-like little object, and such a pity that you can't be here to handle it. Uh, but I would say one of the magical things about Greek pots is that they have no weight. Uh, they are superbly thrown and turned and were made for use and uh, are feather light. It's often a surprise because much of the uh, Greek ceramic is, um, looks like architecture. I do have another one here actually, ha! which I happen to have another one with me. Uh, and this rather splendid ancient Greek pot, again, is feather light. The other thing you might notice about it, and it's a major theme in the book, is that the Greeks began a tradition whereby narrative, telling stories on pots, became a huge issue. Uh, and also where the pot fitted in the house. If you all look, you can see that the inside of the pot, this is, a wine, this is for mixing wine, it's a wine mixer. Uh, it's a, known as a crater. If you look underneath, you can see the decoration under the lip. That's because when it wasn't being used, it would be up there so that you could see the decoration. But also the Greeks, like the Romans after them, tended to recline, tended to lie on one elbow when they ate. So if this were had all the wine in it, uh, it will be slightly above eye level, so you will be able to see the pattern. So. The Greeks and Romans established a tradition. The next two major transformers, I would say, <coughs> were the Islamic nations, uh, absolutely Islam and the invasion of Islam across North Africa and then into Spain. Without the Islamic potters, uh, we wouldn't ha have had really much of the Western tradition uh, would disappear. Uh, the Italian Renaissance would disappear. Uh, Spanish hispano moresque pottery would disappear and obviously Delftware and all the northern Tinglace activity, it wouldn't be there. Uh, it's the intellectual agenda and the pattern work of the Islamic potters uh, transformed ceramic and the first major culture uh, to make proper use of glaze uh, to create patterns and surfaces. So uh, classicism uh, uh, was combined in many respects with uh, Islam to create the next generation of ceramics. And I do actually have, oh yes, I do. So I have a plate here. Um, the Islamic nations arrived in Spain in 711 and they brought ceramic technology with them and by uh, 1200, 1300, they'd introduced tin glaze, but also luster glaze, but also magnificent approaches to pattern, which I'm sure you can pick up from this magnificent plate. So this plate is based on a shield uh, with a boss in the middle, but also reflected the, the patterns of eating of the Spanish uh, and Islamic nations. It, it's reflective of tapas or commun communal eating. And this plate is really a combination of what was going on 
in Europe at the time, which was a pretty crude medievalism. And the Islamic potters brought this uh, magnificent pattern form which swept Europe. A nice thing about this plate, which I think the, the makers amongst you will be interested in, is that if you look at the back, and hopefully you can see that uh, reflection's not, how's the reflection, Pete? It's not too bad there, is it? You can see. If you can see that, that's luster decoration on the back, but you can see it's much lighter. It's rather beautiful, but cruder. Uh, and what we believe is because uh, the tinglaze surface, as many of you know, is very unforgiving. It's a bit like working in watercolor. You can't, it's quite difficult to, um, you can't, if you make a mistake, it's there. That it would have been an apprentice who gets to work on the backs uh, and gets to have a go and learns how to do it. And the master would have decorated the front. Um, we think that's why the backs often have this very loose open work and the fronts are like this. Anyway, so. So I suppose what I'm describing is a pattern whereby uh, ceramics uh, started off as a family exercise early on. Uh, it became a communal activity and pottery started to form. And then in a number of waves, it became an enormous, largely international activity and industry and started to become valued, it became a trade. It became a thing in itself. What I try to do in the book, and it's quite hilarious, and uh, I apologize in advance, uh, uh, as to how people had seen potters in the past. And I have to report to you all that for quite long stretches of time, the potters were seen as being kind of very naughty, kind of semi-criminal. Uh, uh, there's lots of records of potters being fined for digging clays in places where they shouldn't, like in roads and in public areas and so forth. And there's no doubt that in, uh, in much areas of medieval society and onwards, they were seen as a kind of class apart, a kind of separate grouping, tended to be a family business and went father to son. Uh, we do know absolutely, and I present as much evidence as I can, that women were also absolutely central to ceramic production and were written out of history by historians later on. But we know that was not the case that many of the great ancient Greek pots and perhaps those pots I've just shown you could well have been made and or decorated by women. So a family business, which then moved on to being a big scale business that started to talk to itself. Potter started to pick up uh, patterns and ideas from other cultures and it became uh, effectively an international, an international art form in itself and absolutely uh, a kind of grouping uh, the Freemasons, uh, as we know, the Masons formed a very tight network to control uh, building and building practices. But pottery never did that, but there was a sense of that around for much of time. I suspect also, and it, it, it's, it's recorded in some places, that keeping uh, uh, technology, uh, uh, kiln building and glaze technology and mixtures of clays relatively secret and within family tended to mean that, uh, uh, that the potters became a slightly separate uh, community to one side. We should also say that, uh, and I suppose it's an idea that comes through in the book, is that ceramic doesn't imply just the technology. Ceramic does not just imply clay. What I would say is that all ceramic is made out of clay but not everything made out of clay is ceramic. Uh, ceramic comes from Karamakos, uh, a region on the edge of ancient Athens. Uh, it was an area where the potters tended to, to collect. Uh, they trained each other, they looked after each other, and they did business and promoted each other. In other words, ceramic right from the start was a culture. It was a discourse. Uh, it was a way of seeing the world. It was not just a technology in the way that painting, painting is not just a way of making flat surfaces. Painting is a discourse and not all flat things with color on are paintings. Uh, painting wires into a larger history and set of ideas. Obviously, so does ceramic. And uh, there's a ceramic language, uh, I would argue. 
uh, that unfolds. Now, I describe that in the book as the ceramic uh, continuum. So to go back to the story, the third big transformer was China. And uh, I've often said that uh, coming from Lancashire, uh, I still think that my mother valued her best China more than she valued her children. I always got that impression as a kid uh, that you could get away with a lot, but if you broke one of your mum's teacups, you were a dead man. And the idea would be that, you know, amongst working class people and people of lower income, ceramic became one of the first art forms that people genuinely could collect and have in their homes. It became the domestic art, uh, really from the later 18th century onwards. And people took pride in it. And I'm sure it's something none of us think about much that uh, my mother would describe it as her best China. In other words, China came to be seen as such a dominant world culture for ceramic that you just needed to use the word China. And that denotes high quality, uh, denotes the entire art form. And it's a tribute to what went on in that incredible country, I'm sure. By the way, the ancient, uh, ancient Romans had a similar one. Uh, they got ancient Roman pottery, and I don't have an example here. Ancient Roman pottery often became Samian ware after Samos, which is a Greek island. And the legend was that the technologies and uh, the major industry had developed on Samos. It's not actually true, I don't know why, but people called it Samian ware. So uh, it was named after a place. But China uh, is a place, and it dominated world ceramic for many centuries. What I've got here. Uh, is an incredible, beautiful little bowl. And what I'm asking you to see there, if you can, uh, are the ridges and decoration, very quiet decoration, uh, a zigzag along the top, and then these little uh, ribbed works there. This is a strange little bowl. Um, it's about a thousand years old. Uh, probably, yeah, uh, pro could be late time, but probably is Song Dynasty China. And de facto, it's porcelain, but really, it's, it's early on. So in some ways, it feels like a very high-fired stoneware. The Chinese in the first centuries, st the stoneware technology and the uh, porcelain technology, as I'm sure many of you know, the Chinese related the two very closely, and clearly the two are, are interrelated. But you can see the ribbing is what I'm aiming for. What's also a fascinating thing is that the material itself is so gorgeous that it doesn't need much else. Uh, it functions as it is. It doesn't need much in the way of prolonged or developed pattern work. It's, it's as though porcelain is in itself a thing. And it was this material that then transformed Europe. The Europeans spent century after century after century uh, trying to mimic Chinese porcelain, trying to invent it. Finally, the Europeans worked out how to make porcelain uh, in 1708. And the Meissen factory opened for business in 1709. So if we say that porcelain was there by about 980 AD, it just took us 800 years to catch up to the Chinese uh, to work out how to make it. And this, I'm sure you would all agree, this little bowl in some ways could be a prototype uh, for much of what happens in modern studio pottery. And it would be quite easy to imagine that this was made, in fact, in the last 20 or 30 years. So classicism, Islam, China, all of these things transforming what ceramic is and ceramic getting more and more complicated, you know, as the decades and centuries wore on are more and more ubiquitous. Uh, the development of coffee drinking and then tea drinking. The development of the very interesting idea by the 18, uh, by late 17th, early 18th century, that of a tendency more and more and more uh, to drink cold liquids out of glass and hot liquids out of ceramic, that tendency developed. Now, clearly some cultures, uh, and, and in this, this country until the early 18th century, you would drink beer out of ceramic. But increasingly, as the glass industry uh, expanded, 
cold liquids uh, went this way and hot liquids went that way. And of course, the whole idea of coffee and tea drinking, which absolutely exponentially expanded from the 18th century, really gave a huge impetus uh, uh, to ceramic as an art form. I might add also that it's one of those fascinating things that uh, when I was at the V&A, uh, we put an exhibition in the program about the Renaissance interior, the Renaissance home. And we tend to forget that uh, really right up to the point of the high Renaissance, the idea of a bedroom uh, didn't really exist in people's houses. You just you slept where you wanted to sleep. The idea of a dining room didn't really exist. And the idea of uh, dining as a ritual that we use now, where we have a place setting and plates and different sizes of plates and so on, uh, is, is very much just the last few centuries. But of course, when that idea of dining and, and of the development of the domestic space evolved, it meant that the ceramic industry and ceramic as an art hugely expanded and became uh, one of the great ubiquitous arts, an art that is absolutely everywhere. So the last transformer, I would say, to get to it, I call the modern. And that is the way that the planet was transformed, starting with Europe. Uh, you could argue, when does the modern begin? I tend to start it early. I think that the beginnings of modernity are in the later 17th century, in the very early enlightenment, and chug along, and then the explosion of science and technology into the 18th century physically transforms the planet. But the notion of modern man, of modern thinking, of what it is to be an individual, the evidence is absolutely there. Uh, uh, it's evolving with Shakespeare. It's absolutely there by late Rembrandt. It's obviously there when you look at the growth of cities at the end of the 17th century and then into the 18th century, uh, technologies for mass producing stuff, which enabled us, first of all, to stay alive longer and to grow uh, huge communities, the modern age. And ceramic was at the very heart of uh, that modern expansion. Uh, I argue in the book that ceramic did not have an industrial revolution like the cotton industry or like the iron and steel industries. Uh, the story of ceramic is completely different and it unfolded differently. Um, in some ways, there is no industrial revolution in ceramic. Rather, ceramic had a number of revolutions from the Greeks onwards, which occasionally transformed it. And it was transformed, I would say, for the fourth time in the modern period uh, and expanded uh, very dramatically. And alongside that, alongside the expansion of ceramic as an industry, what we also get is the evolution of the idea of the individual ceramic artist that really barely existed before. Uh, ceramic was a team activity and the idea of uh, ceramic as a, an individual artist working in a studio, that is something of the modern age. That's something we invented. And we would say that Cornwall, enormously important in the evolution of the modern studio tradition. Uh, of modern studio ceramics. Uh, it's hard to imagine it without your region, isn't it? Impossible, in fact. Uh, and we know uh, who the giant figure was who, uh, who helped bring this about. So, have a couple of little pots here by Bernard Leach. Uh, one of the great figures, it's a pair of bowls, as you can see, and it's normally displayed and normally shown. I have to say, I got these uh, when I was quite a young lad and uh, I broke both bowls, ball. they, they both had peanuts in and I broke both of them, uh, but I love these bowls dearly. Uh, Bernard Leach uh, returned, as many of you know, all of you I would think, from Japan in 1920 and set up in Sentives in Cornwall and in effect triggered uh, a revolution in the way we think about ceramic as an art form. One of the things I think is uh, interesting about Bernard is, and it tends to be in the other arts as well, but I've noticed it very powerfully in ceramic, 
that he's also a beautiful writer uh, and a proselytizer, uh, 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 yeah, proselytizing uh, ceramic around the world. Uh, he, as you know, he did lecture tours of America. He promoted an idea of ceramic as an art form, but also ceramic as an ethical, as something with an ethical agenda of a way of seeing the world. Uh, ceramic as a practice which uh, had things to contribute to the idea of civilization. And in some respects, uh, Bernard's ideas came down pretty directly from William Morris and the arts and crafts movement. And you could easily argue, I suppose mostly I'm a historian of the later 19th, early 20th centuries, what I do most of the time. But if you, if you go from 1880 through to the publication of a Potter's book in 1941, Bernard's great book, you look at that 60 year period, uh, British art was more important then than at any other time in its history. And essentially it was the arts and crafts uh, the grand arts and crafts ethic, which literally swept the planet. There are arts and crafts movements in Australia, New Zealand, all over America, Africa, Southern America, throughout Europe, Scandinavia, and so forth. That notion that making things is an ethical agenda, that it's about a way of life. It's not just about manufacturing things. It's about um, the art object. Uh, improving civilization. We could say that that's maybe the single greatest contribution of British culture to the visual arts. And Bernard is one of the great giants of that. Now, hugely controversial figure in some ways. And, uh, you know, I'm a bit snitty about him in my book in places, but I would say that uh, without Bernard Leach and his, uh, his promotional approach, it's very hard to imagine uh, modern ceramic. As many of you know, it then triggered a next generation of people who went on to create uh, truly wonderful pots. And I have some of them here. This fabulous teapot is, now look at the ridges and think of China. Uh, David Leach, uh, one of the world's nicest, nicest men, I would say. And this is my teapot. And I have to say, uh, I chipped the spout and I told David, I said, I've got a beautiful teapot by you, David. And he said, good. And I said, I chipped the spout. And he said, good. That means it's worth nothing. And also, you know, it means you're using it, which is great. And uh, so uh, my teapot, uh, you know, wears its chip with pride. Uh, but David, in some ways, a fantastic technician, probably in straightforward potting terms, we'd all agree, uh, pretty, uh, probably superior to his father. Now, a bit of the story that we tend not to tell, and this is where uh, Bernard's idea of ceramic history is a bit naughty. Uh, Bernard tended to dismiss and throw out anything in the history of ceramic that he didn't really like. So his idea of history is a very limited thing. And uh, he was very, very circumspect about what had come immediately before him. For example, uh, I would argue that the real beginnings of the studio tradition of uh, an individual developing their own studio and making their own wares, uh, it was actually alive and well in France in the 1880s. Um, and this beautiful pot that hopefully you can see with incredible uh, Chinese influence glaze is by Eugene Delahirsch. And Delos is one of the great Art Nouveau potters and at the middle of the Art Nouveau movement. And uh, you can see it's organic, it's simple, uh, but uh, with you know, immense technical skill in how the glazes are developed. But uh, Delos was practicing pretty much in a studio with his sons on a small scale in a way that we would recognize now, I would say. And likewise, uh, this pot, which I have to say is one of my favorites, this wonderful Arnavo pot is by Emile Dacour. And uh, again, you can see it's raw and rough. It's a real celebration of surface and clay. And it's enormously organic. 
Uh, I have to say, my son said to me, it looks like one of the pods in the Alien film. So you expect something to pop out of it. But um, these guys, I think, uh, laid the terrain that Bernard Leach then went on to really capitalize on. Uh, the French were already practicing uh, a studio heritage, but it was relatively quiet and dispersed. It really took Leach as a, an individual and a propagandist uh, to consolidate and push it forward. That would be my view. Uh, what I would also say, which is uh, interesting, is that the, um, the French were looking hugely to China and to Chinese glaze technology and to stoneware. And they, they effectively created what we sometimes call the stoneware revival. Stoneware had, had largely kind of dissipated in the 19th century and went down market. Uh, things were either earthenware uh, and made into majolica or porcelain, but the French, uh, the French potters brought stoneware back and they were looking at China. As we know, Bernard was hugely looking at Japan and to an extent Korea. So that, that does give a different flavor to what they were doing. Uh, looking at some of these others, uh, one of uh, Bernard's uh, great rivals and who in some ways argued with him an enormous amount uh, was William State Murray. And William State Murray uh, very aggressively treated himself uh, as an artist with a capital A. And he didn't buy into uh, Leach's ethical agenda, uh, the kind of William Morris approach to things. He didn't really buy that. He, he really saw the modern potter as directly equivalent to the modern painter and ran his studio accordingly. I swirled this around a little bit because again, you can see the fluting uh, that's over a thousand years old. Uh, if you look carefully, you can't quite see what State Murray is doing. There are actually stems of flowers and the flower heads are at the top of the vase. So by contrast with the ancient Greeks, I quickly add, and the Chinese, uh, I can barely hold this pot up. It weighs about two tons. Uh, but this is William State Murray and Bernard Leach. And the grand debates of the middle 20th century are to do with uh, whether ceramic is a pure art uh, that has no wider agenda or whether ceramic plugs into society as following the William Morris ideal and has a wider ethical vision. What I would say to you all is that I think this is an interesting debate again. I think we're back in times where we're thinking, what is the role of culture? Uh, what is the role of all the arts uh, in the society that we are limping through at this point in time? I have to say, one of the things that occurred to me, uh, I would say very quickly, uh, I am the least able craftsperson any of you are ever likely to meet. Uh, but I dug a huge pond during COVID. Uh, I noticed that uh, my sons and uh, half my friends started baking their own bread. Everybody started doing their own shelves and growing things. Human beings have a genetic predisposition to physically engage with the world and to express themselves through the world. And I, I would say in all honesty that ceramic, because the material itself is cheap, if not worthless. Christopher Dresser always said, uh, you know, ceramic is the greatest art because it costs nothing. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that, does it, that doesn't, when you're trying to survive and make a living, it doesn't help. But, you know, it's not gold bullion. It's a ubiquitous art, which is everywhere. And if you look through uh, uh, international society, most societies have left us with wonderful levels of expression through their pots. And often their pots are widely understood by all levels of society. It raises very interesting issues going forward uh, in the world as we have it, uh, how we might revive the idea of physically building our world again, uh, eliminating plastic, uh, thinking about how we should employ ourselves uh, now that banking is going to be replaced, uh, bankers will be replaced with robots if we're lucky. And the idea that all of us uh, have more time to actually be creative. Uh, perhaps the moment has come once again for a big push uh, to celebrate uh, the handmade arts. I just thought I would start to wind up by um, the grand studio tradition that Leach 
State Murray and others expanded, we all know is alive and well. And I have a few lovely examples uh, here. Well, first of all, this is a lovely bowl by Catherine Playdell Bouvery. And again, uh, the fluting you can see. And this, this bowl was obviously very badly broken and has been very lovingly repaired. If you look closely, you can see it's been repaired Japanese style and then covered, and then the repairs covered with gold leaf. Catherine Playdell Bouvery, one of the great women artists of the mid 20th century and one of the great potters. And I thought it would be nice to come up to speed. Clive Bowen, uh, who uh, I've ne I've, I must, I'm most anxious to go uh, to see Clive Bowen's setup and pottery, but down in the regions where you are, but uh, magnificent painterly vases, which pull together so much about what modern ceramic has been over the last period of time. I thought I would also show you, and I think um, it's interesting because uh, to show you how uh, uh, the leech ethic, the arts and crafts ethic, the way it transmitted all over the world, but nowhere more powerfully than America. Uh, this is a lovely little bull by Warren McKenzie, uh, one of the great figures in American studio pottery. And uh, you could be forgiven for thinking this was a British pot, I would say. Uh, it has all the same sensibilities to it and a lovely thing. And this thing I think will surprise all of you. This little lidded vase with wonderful, wonderful splashes on it is an early Betty Woodman. And uh, just to show that uh, many of the most avant-garde potters, many of the people who went on to create installations and stuff like that, nevertheless, they, many of them began as pretty straightforward, wonderful studio potters. And this one again, this is by uh, American Paul Soldner. And Paul Soldner uh, was a close friend and associate of Peter Volkus, whom you will all know as being the artist who made enormous, big, rough expressionist works. So did uh, Paul Soldner. But again, his early years, he made these really very exquisite, beautifully sensitive vases. That's a rather lovely piece. And I suppose uh, my point My point would be that no matter how um, no matter how abstract, no matter how big, no matter how avant-garde practice appears uh, in ceramic, it usually roots back to uh, uh, to its basic roots. In the book, in fact, and it's, it will be subject of another talk altogether. I see three things as components of the ceramic tradition, not just pots. Uh, the figurine or the making of, of figures, fired small scale figures, has been right at the heart of the ceramic her heritage right from the very beginning. And also tile and the tile tradition. So I see the three as intertwined and unfolding through history. So in a way you might argue that the vessel is at the heart, that the tile is about making the building into a vessel, you know, a tile building effectively it becomes a container for people but the same technology and often the same pattern work and obviously figurines hollow fired and often uh, functioning in a in the domestic space domestic scale sculpture so i see the history of ceramic as those three things unfolding through the millennia and i would say that if you look around at contemporary practice um, it still roots back to that i would argue it still roots back to that Oh yeah, one other thing. Uh, I really came to ceramic, as I say, I taught at Cardiff Art School as a young lad. And when I got there, I was really teaching the history of painting uh, and having been trained as an art historian and as a painter. 
when I got there, I realized that the ceramic department was far nicer, not just that they could all cook, which was very nice, but it was a golden age over there in the West Country. And one of the big figures for me was Michael Casson, who taught there and who very much uh, took care of me and brought me on. And I remember there was a moment where we decided the time had come to try and write a history of ceramic course, because up to that point, we just tended to take the ceramic students and shove them in with the painting students when we taught them the history of art. Uh, that tended to be how we did it. It's how most people did do it. And the idea of a separate ceramic history, uh, we thought it didn't exist and we thought we couldn't teach it. And uh, Mick and I wrote a course together. And I remember saying to him, well, I can do the ancient Greeks and I can do Picasso. And if you can fill in the bit in the middle, like the 2000 years in the middle, we're laughing. So Mick and I taught this course together where we tried to develop um, a way of seeing ceramic uh, in history which was um, peculiar to ceramic itself. Uh, it's about what ceramic is, uh, essentially, and what it's meant historically. Anyway, uh, these two wonderful jugs that you might see here. Are in that wonderful moment when Mick was working with uh, uh, this beautiful blue finish. And as you know, one of the great heroes of um, salt glaze. And maybe we would argue uh, that salt glaze, after the Leech Revolution, salt glaze is one of the big things. I notice um, internationally, we, we are thought, uh, the British are thought to be uh, uh, the nation that rediscovered salt glaze properly and brought it back into the studio arena. I think that's a reasonably fair assumption. And I'm sure you'll agree, this is a fantastic, wonderful, wonderful object. Oops. And one of the people that uh, Mick worked with all those years, of course, was Walter Keeler. And this is uh, a lovely object by Wally Keeler. And what I tend, what I find wonderful about Wally is the endless um, invention. And in some ways, it sums up, doesn't it, what ceramic is? Because you've got this medieval glaze uh, that immediately throws you back to Germany in 1400. But at the same time, you have this tubular like thing, which is kind of like surrealism. And if you look just under that handle, these little points that come here, uh, kind of naughty, looks a bit naughty to me. It's, uh, it's to do with modern sculpture in some ways. One of the truly great things about ceramic, I, it always occurs to me is, its ability to absorb uh, everything around it and all the culture around it and make something different, make something which is unique to itself. Anyway, Wally Keeler. Um, so anyway, folks, that's roughly what the book is about. Uh, I wouldn't recommend trying to read it in a day. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a hefty creature, but... I would hugely enjoy uh, hearing back from you all about what you think of it uh, when you get into it, because it is an attempt to characterize what many of you do and, and what many of you love. And uh, I would enormously enjoy uh, getting your views on it. So I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, are we into a question session? Is that right, Tom? Well, maybe, yes. If, if I could just ask um, members who are viewing to uh, ask any questions that they would like, you can unmute yourself, you have to do that, and you can turn on your um, video, and then I will pick up the questions either by you sending in a chat, or you can raise your hand and you can, I will ask you to uh, put forward your question but please unmute, unmute yourself. I think um, we don't, he's asking, he wants questions. He's waiting for questions, but mm -hmm. I don't know how to answer. Yes. Everybody's muted. No, right. I'm unmuted.
Oh, that's nice. Right. Any? Do we have any questions? Yeah, I can't find the um, raise hand button, unfortunately. Can I just chip in, Paul? Yeah, of course you can. Sorry. Hi. Uh, hi, Paul. Uh, Martin Harbour here. I'm from West Country Potters. Um, it was quite interesting. I, I felt a little bit of a link. First of all, I was at UEA, but before the Sainsbury Centre was built. And I now live in Shebia, which is where Clive Bones Pottery is. Um, one of the things that I wanted to pick up on was really, if you like, the continuum of the um, Greek um, drinking vessel that you showed, which was exquisite. And the fact that when you go around Clive Bowen's house, uh, basically you eat off plates and drink from mugs, which are probably uh, some of the most beautiful pieces of uh, slip uh decorated earthenware and it's this idea of actually having utility wear which is actually beautiful to uh to look at as well and we seem to lose that for a whole period period of time uh, and now that seems to be coming back as something quite distinctive and i was wondering if you've got any particular observations on that as to how that might be uh the continuing now with uh, with other potters and the, the, the tradition, maybe even linking it up to the throw down on the telly and things like that. People are looking at ceramics in a slightly different way again. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it, it's a really interesting moment, I think, in that uh, all the way through my career, you spend all your life thinking, this is the moment, you know, finally we're back. Finally, ceramic is getting its due. But the reality is that it, it's never really, it, it, it fades backwards again and uh, life gets tough for the potters. Uh, life gets tough trying to do exhibitions about ceramic and so forth. But what I would say is this last five or six years, um, there has been a really significant shift in, in my view in interest in ceramic. And I agree, it could be things like that television program, which is great for all of us. Uh, I think also, very sadly, many of the um, uh, degree programs in ceramic in the art schools have gone, but there's been a big surge of cooperatives and of young people setting up, I've noticed. I think also there's a new politics of lifestyle amongst younger people um, about saving the earth. Uh, you know, when the recession of 2009 came, who did it hit most? The young. Uh, you know, university tuition fees, when they came, who did that hit? The young. The rest of us got it for free. Suddenly it's £9,000. So there's a sort of politics of youth around. And one of the elements of that, I think, in a good way, is the idea that you can be an artist who makes things, sells them at reasonable price and can make a living. I think also, and we've all felt it this last year, I myself have been uh, shielded for much of the year, so I'm going completely crackers. But the, uh, the idea of the home as a work of art, again, of trying to surround ourselves with things that make us feel good uh, and that lift us. And I think also there's even a scientific element to it, isn't there, of the idea that there is such a thing as a making gene, that as a species we have a tendency to want to fabricate and make things. Uh, far more than any other species. Other species do make things, but nothing in nothing like the way we do. So it does seem to me that there's a big moment again. And uh, uh, I think all we can do is push it hard and, uh, and try and support it. Okay, uh, because it is to do with changing quality of life, I think. I mean, don't you think so? I mean, the idea that you eat and drink off Clive Burns, I mean, that's about as close to heaven as I would ever expect. To be. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's quite interesting. We could promote that. Yes. Yeah, when we, we, we unpacked, having moved down to, uh, to Devon, I found pots that I bought in a potter's market or a craft market at UEA in the, in the 1970s, uh, mm. which w there was a sort of the same sort of generational thing coming out of, I guess, the 60s. And everybody, you know, one of my university mates went off and did leather work and things like that. So, yeah, it sort of seems to come in waves. But I agree. Uh, it is an optimistic time at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, could I ask Fee Smart to ask a question, please? 
Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that was a wonderful talk, really fantastic talk. Um, can I just ask, I, I listened to a, um, a very interesting talk yesterday, actually, by uh, her name escapes me, I'm afraid, but it was about the uh, greening up um, ceramic. Um, and um, I was just thinking, you've got this um, extraordinary overview of, of history. How do you see ceramic changing in the future because of these environmental concerns with perhaps people producing more non-fired work and um, working with the, just the sort of tons and tons and tons of existing ceramic? Um, you know, how do you see it developing because of those concerns? Hmm. Um, I have to say, I hadn't thought of, of that. I, it does remind me of uh, talking to Mick Casson in Cardiff in the old days, and he uh, he's very naughtily said that the reason all the salt glaze people moved over there is that uh, uh, they could uh, that the authorities couldn't catch up with them as quick when they fired the kilns, and, uh, and clearly salt glaze is not a clean process. That's for sure. What we would say is that. Um, uh, it's never going to be in the quantities and scale uh, uh, that kind of firing to really endanger uh, the environment. Clearly, Stoke-on-Trent in the 18th and 19th century, you know, that's environmentally very damaging. I would say that um, uh, much ceramic process, whilst it, you know, it's clearly an issue of sorts, it's not a big one. I mean, I would say that I, there is much interesting work about uh, that one has seen in, with recycled ceramic and with um, uh, other approaches to clay. Uh, but for me, I would say that uh, the point and the culture of ceramic is to do with taking clay out of the ground, refining it, making it into something and firing it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's what it is. Uh, if we stop firing clay, uh, for me, uh, that's not the ceramic heritage. It's different. Uh, it could be equally wonderful, you know. Uh, as I say, there are many artists who work with ceramic shards and stuff like that. Interesting. Uh, but for me, the ceramic heritage is to do with that primordial thing of uh, earth and fire. Uh, for me, that's what the poetry is. Uh, and... Um, it's, an it's a simple technology at one level uh, that becomes profoundly complicated, doesn't it? When, uh, when you make it into wonderful things. So uh, I think it's wonderful if, if people wish to work with re recycled clay, uh, but I really do think that's something else. And if it's not fired, um, it's difficult to define it as ceramic, I would think. Now, uh, people could debate that. Uh, I could see that absolutely there's another point of view. Uh, but my book is about uh, earth and fire. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, could I just ask if there's anybody else who'd like to ask a question? Yeah, I do. Go on then. Is that um, the yeah, I... oh, sorry, Noreen, go on. Yeah, I want, to, I want to ask a few questions about your book. Um, and, and the reason I would be, um, you've got to understand I'm coming from the, um, the space of big, a glass artist rather than a ceramicist. So I'm interested in how much um, your book, how many um, pictures your book has. I like picture books. <laughs> Everybody likes picture books, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of pictures in the book, 430. Right. Um, and, and is that enough? Is that enough? <laughs> Quite a few. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. I just I like looking at the I like uh, looking at the the designs and everything. But um, I'm afraid your ceramics don't interest me a great deal. Um, how much of the book is is given over to the um, the last century? Uh, a lot. Um, uh, I would say there are nine chapters. They're very big. The, cha the book's like 230,000 words. It's a big book. And yeah. chapters seven, eight, and nine really take us through the modern period. They begin, seven begins with the mid-Victorians, and it shows how the ceramic modernized itself and, and what it became. So completely the last two chapters, and they're the two biggest in the book, and, and much of chapter seven. 
Um, so uh, the book deals with uh, modern and contemporary quite heavily. Yeah, it does. I, I felt it important to uh, put history at the service of practice. Okay, uh, how much of it ta is taken over by Bernard Leach? Uh, not that much, surprisingly. I mean, Bernard, I emphasize Bernard now because of who I'm talking to. Uh, uh, well, you're, well, I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sure many sorry, of you I'm... watching have tattoos of Bernard Leach on your chests and uh, whatever, but no. Bernard is hugely important. And so uh, if I were talking to another group, I, I might, I would talk about Bernard, but not so much, I would say. Uh, but uh, uh, Bernard is very important and is dealt with, but uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, Germany, France, Italy, Britain, Scandinavia, America, and then towards the end, you know, uh, you know, the other grand traditions and the way that ceramic has globalized uh, is really what the emphasis is in the book. Right. OK, thank you. Could, could I ask a question, please, Paul? Um, mm -hmm. Just before we finish up. Um, I'd like to know that on the shelf behind you, you've got some fantastic uh, ceramics. Uh, which one of those is your real favourite and why? Um, if you could just have one pot, what would it be? Mm. Uh, I've got other shelves as well, folks. Well, I, I and, uh, yes, but... Uh, but of the ones behind me, yeah. well, to be honest, um, uh, it's a very hard, I mean, having spent my life in museums where you get saturated every day with wonderful things. Uh, what I've always found is that uh, uh, when your mood changes, uh, you know, some days, you know, you feel like one kind of food and on other days you feel like another. So there's a range of ceramic that uh, grips me wonderfully. Uh, and uh, occasionally, you know, I think, uh, you, you know, I would like to marry that pot and spend the rest of my life just with it. Uh, but then, you know, something else will take over. So I wouldn't say I've got I've got uh, definitive favourites, but um, uh, occasionally something uh, grips me very passionately. For example, I didn't show anyone, but um, Martin Brothers. You know, the Martin Brothers. Um, uh, are really quite extraordinary people, aren't they? And, and it's, um, as you look at that, you never saw anyone who looked more English than that man. And, uh, uh, and when you look at what the Martin brothers did, you know, what a wonderful enterprise. And of course, they didn't just make these wonderful grotesques, they made superb uh, Japanese style vases and so forth. So, you know, on that Italian Renaissance Maiolica, you know, occasionally. I suppose deep in my heart, uh, I'm always shocked by the Greeks and uh, the imagination and range of the Greek potters uh, uh, grabs me. And then there's a huge panoply of uh, modern and contemporary material, which I truly, truly love. Oh yes, there's a pot I forgot to show you. Um, because uh, it wouldn't fit on the shelf, but this <laughs> fantastic Richard Batterham, and uh, if you can all see it, I would say one of the great, great figures of studio ceramic. I'm sure many of you agree. And uh, yeah, that's not the lightest pot, but I suppose I've pleasantly avoided answering your question. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a period of being obsessed with Bernard Palisi as well. And, uh, oops, is that still? I had a period obsessed with Bernard Palisi, and you kind of think, uh, was there ever a greater genius, you know, in any of the visual arts? Because not only a great ceramic artist, but a wide ranging, inter ranging intellectual, hugely concerned with the environment and nature and so on and so on, uh, who eventually died in prison because of his religious beliefs. And you kind of think there are not many greater heroes than that. So I suppose what I would say is that the, the history of ceramic is studied with great figures. And some of them were privileged, aren't we? Are amongst us still and are around still. So 
um, I change what my favorite things are. And I, I suppose also one of the big themes in the book is um, ubiquity. There's a lot of it. Uh, ceramic is an art of reproduction. It's intrinsically inexpensive to produce. And so there's a kind of cacophony of masterpieces in any culture that you go to, uh, which makes it wonderful. So it's not like painting where you could say late Rembrandt or uh, early Picasso. Uh, it seems to me that the range of choice is so great you know, that you, you change your mind from week to week. Well, well, thank you for that. And I will just say that there have been an awful lot of um, thank you messages sent in by chat. And I'm going to pass over to, to Jenny in a minute for a vote of thanks. Um, but I'd ask you, in anticipation, if you could um, turn your uh, videos back on and unmute yourself, because we want to show our appreciation in a few moments. But if I could pass over to Jenny, please. Jenny Hale. Okay, I'm unmuted, guys. Hi, hi, Paul. Thank you. That was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I completely um, love your collection of ceramics that you have behind and in fact, share uh, with some of the some of the pots I've collected over my career in ceramics. Oh, I did actually want to ask you a question about your career in, in fine art as a painter. If you saw how um, ceramics um, moved in the same directions as the fine artists as the, as the years went go on because I do see that in um, in ceramics as it's developing and I just wondered your opinion because you trained as a fine artist but your fascination yeah. is with ceramics. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a section in my book about painting and pottery uh, because it's not just um, in the 20th century that uh, a lot of painters <sighs> became um, uh, deeply interested in ceramic and made use of it. And as you know, quite a lot of the top ceramic, uh, quite a lot of the top potters started as painters, not least Bernard Leach and others as well. So that relationship's there. But in actual fact, it was nearly always there. Um, there's always been a relationship between painting uh, and clay. And uh, it could be that, get that back they're on. both arts of coloured mud, aren't they? They both, um, there's a, a shared language in some ways. But uh, of all the arts, those two, it seems to me, are the closest, you know. At one time, metalwork and ceramic, very close uh, at various moments. But there's an intimate relationship between painting and ceramic, that's for sure. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I don't know if there's any more questions from, from the viewers and the participants. Um, but, but what I'd like to say is thank you so much for this, this lecture. <laughs> It's mm -hmm. fascinating. And I also want to thank uh, Pete Huggins for filming and uh, who's a, an extraordinary photographer and has done all the photography in the book, which I have to say, I do have a copy of and it's fantastic and very, very readable. Um, and it, talk, it talks in a language that, that you, know, you can easily relate to. And I, I just, I can't recommend it enough. Um, so I'd like, to, I hope you all agree that this has just been a brilliant lecture and um, could we all, um, I don't know what you do to say thank you on Zoom. <laughs> we can all clap this is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It, 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 has been, it has been truly marvellous. Well, thanks everybody. Oh, I, and I just and, want to uh, say, one more. won't be long, hopefully, before I can come to Cornwall. Turn this off, my favorite places. Uh, one more thing I wanted to say that Pete Huggins has done all the photography in the book. And if any of you need some really amazing photography done of your work, then perhaps we can get his details and put them on our websites. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Pete will give them, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's well worth, as I'm sure you'll agree, it's well worth having your work beautifully photographed in the, in, we're all living online, aren't we? So the photograph has become hugely more important. Yeah. Anyway, well, thanks everyone. I hugely enjoyed that and maybe see you all in the flesh one day Thank when you. I get down there.